Now, how many, how many people remember Zanga? <laughs> I remember having a conversation about seven years ago with a friend of mine in the car, and he said, Sam, you know, you ever heard of Zanga? I'm like, of course I heard of Zanga. He goes, you know, my roommates actually made Zanga. I'm like, really? He goes, he goes yeah, you know, Dar Zanga, Zanga was created at Dartmouth. And he was so proud that Dartmouth finally did something, you know, because they had some IV insecurity. Um, he goes, yeah, you know, I wanted to go to Harvard or Princeton, but I got to Dartmouth. And he, he felt a little insecure. But when Zanga was like, you know, how many people actually paid for Zanga? Those, the, the special things on the page, you pay $20 a month. I know you're ashamed, so don't raise your hand. But, you know, he was talking about Zanga and how, you know, I'm, and we're like both talking about, yeah, man, my roommates are so rich now. How many people still use Zanga? Zanga is bye-bye. It's hasta la vista, baby. It's no longer cool. No one is on Zanga. Why? Because times change, especially tech changes, right? And then we had something else that came up, MySpace. How many people are on MySpace? It's really just space now, MySpace. There's nothing going on there. It, it's like no one goes there because, you know, what they couldn't figure out as, you know, Rudolph Murdoch bought it in News Corp, Fox 5, well, anything with Fox 5, you know, scandalous there. But um, they couldn't learn that the key towards social networking was exclusivity, which Zuck got right, and now he's going to be worth $30 billion. How many people are envious of that? You know, actually, let me just go on a trail here. You know, there's a Korean artist that actually painted the first campus of Facebook. And um, Sean Parker came out to him and said, hey, uh, Pete, you know, we don't have that much cash. We have Facebook stock. Can we pay you in Facebook stock? And Pete was like, and he said in his head, I bet you this is worth crap. But he felt bad, so he took Facebook stock. Guess how much that stock is worth now? 200 million to paint the darn wall. Now, whoever said artists don't make money, they're wrong. OK? I mean, OK, so going, going back, you see, Facebook did not adapt and change to its surrounding. I mean, how could we forget this one? AOL. <laughs> Everyone used AOL. If you still have an AOL address, you have problems. Some people actually in the Midwest are still paying for AOL. They, they don't know it's free. It's free? What's broadband? What's T1? I mean. AOL is a classic story of the greatest mistake in, mistake in corporate history. Time Warner bought AOL with a merger and paid two, over $200 billion. That's two times of Facebook. And of course, when, cable, when you know, broadband and cable came, when faster internet came, when there were more accessibility, AOL what? went down the toilet. Goodbye. Right? And so, what do you learn here in business? It's a universal and empirical law that's just a matter of fact true. What is that law? That law is simple. If you do not adapt or change, you what? You die. If you don't change, you die. It's an, it's an evolutionary principle or law in the universe. It is operated that way. If you do not change and adapt into your environment, you die. Now, as in business or even economics, as in life, if you do not, what? Change, you die. Tell someone, I don't want you to die. I, that's why I want you to change. I'm serious. You know, the gospel says that anyone in Christ is what? A new creation. I mean, you look at the people around you and you go, yeah, these people need to become new creations. It's just the old has gone and the new has come. Anyone in Christ is... A, so the, what is the hope of the gospel? The hope of the gospel is not the external transformation. Meaning, hey, what do I get? What type of advancement can I get? The real heart of the gospel is transformation in the inside. 
Because what defines us more than anything is not the change that's going on outside of us. And you know what? That constant is always going to be there. Things are always going to change, just like technology, just like our lives, just like seasons. But what will define us in the end is how much we change in the inside. And the hope of the gospel is that no matter how stuck you are somewhere, no matter how dark some place is, change is possible. But we talked about that last week. Just because you can't doesn't mean what? You will. But today, as we read Joshua, we see that you have to seize opportunities when changes come. When the opportunities have come, you have to seize them because change has an expiration date. You can't change every day. These opportunities come all the time. You need to recognize and seize when it's time to change. So today, I want to talk to you about and unpack our vision of why we want to release people that embrace change and not resist it, okay? Tell someone, I want you to change today, even if I have to beat you up. Let the gospel beat you up. So let's go to to Joshua 2. Now, here's what you have to get from this passage. First of all, Rahab is a prostitute, okay? Okay? Her occupation is not so worthy, not so holy. And, and, and the, uh, who's the other character in the story? Joshua. And Joshua was the son of who? Son of none. You take none and ho, they're very big contrasts there. But you see, this prostitute finds something and say profound things that we need to catch in this passage. Now, why is even a, a story about a prostitute named Rahab told? And you know what? It's not just found in Joshua. It's also found in the New Testament. People recommend and commend Rahab for the faith she had in Christ. The faith she had in God 2,000 years before Jesus even came. Why are we telling story about Rahab? What did she do? Well, she recognized and heard stories about who? God. And it says, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up the roof and said to them, I know that what? Read it with me. I know that who? The Lord. Now, this person is a prostitute. She never heard the Torah. She never heard the books of the Bible. But she heard stories of this God in Egypt that destroyed everything in its path, that literally just beat the crap out of the most powerful nation in the world. And they were like, who is this guy? She she heard it third hand. It was a third source. She did not see it. She did not experience it. She just heard it it, through the lens of history from a third point of view. And she says that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of of you has fallen on us. You see that? She goes, we know, we we look at you, we know you couldn't have done that. You people slaves. But something came over you, and the only explanation is is that's, that's God. There must be a God with you. And she knew, even though she never heard directly from a third source, that this God was powerful. So what did she do? She decided to lin it. She decided to seize carpe lin, carpe diem. She decided to really seize the day. The most unexpected person, I, I know we can find like almost every parallel to, to lin these days, and uh, it's on ESPN so much that it's part of my vocabulary now. <laughs> but why are we told of her story? Well, because she seized it, did not miss it. But what about everybody else? Because if you keep reading on, it says that the Israelites destroyed the Amorites, dried up the Red Sea, destroyed Egypt, and she was afraid that everybody in Jericho would die. She was really afraid. And the the truth is, everybody knew and heard this news. Why didn't they just go to Joshua and say, 
Your God is too strong. Your God is too powerful for us. Yes, we're, we're, we're afraid. Can we join you? We surrender. You know, that's what people do in the basketball court to me when, before I go on at Staten Island. Pastor Billy goes, I surrender. I know you're going to hit that fadeaway three on me. And I go, I know. But you know, even if he said that to me, I'm not that gracious like God. I'd be like, no. I love beating you. But th this doesn't happen. The people in Jericho don't go to Joshua. They don't surrender. Only Rahab does. Why? Because they miss it. What about all the people that miss the opportunity to change? Because the truth is, most of us miss so many things, right? Like, for example, I hate, I mean, how many people love McDonald's breakfast? I mean, come on. If you don't like McDonald's, you need to get saved today. I mean, maybe you need to get saved anyway, but say get saved twice. Because, I mean, the Egg McMuffin sandwich, I ate that today in the morning. My wife got it for me. But, I mean, when I go to McDonald's and I'm like, I, I walk over to McDonald's, this is how I walk over. Yes. <laughs> the Egg McMuffin sandwich is good. And, it's, you know, you could even get two because it's only 250 calories. That's 500 right there. That's not bad for breakfast. Right? No hash browns. That's bad. Now, you go, you go over there, I'm like, hack, and I, I get up there and I smile, you know, th that's their tagline, you know, we're here to make you smile. I'm like, yes, make, make me smile. I go up there, let me get an Eggman muffin sandwich, two of them. Sorry. It's 11 o'clock. I'm like, I'm sh surely, as the Lord lives, you have an Eggman muffin back there. Sir, I'm sorry, it's 11 o'clock, and... You missed, you just missed it. I'm like, I didn't miss it. Your clock is three seconds fast. You're like, no, you missed it. You missed it. You know, we miss things every day. Miss the train, miss phone calls, well, sometimes intentionally. Right? We miss waking up. We, we miss our alarm. We, we miss an assignment. We missed paying a bill. We miss, we continue to miss, and if you continue to look at your life, the motif that continues to get orchestrated is how we missed things in our life more than we hit things. And if you th really think about this, stop for a moment and thought about it, you've got to think about all the things you continue to miss, and it's scary. Because that's how we live our lives every day with the most important elements of our life, when the opportunity to change, when God sends these opportunities, these trials, these et cetera, these transitions, a lot of us, what we do is we just complain, oh, why is this going on? Why is there a war? Why is there an election? Why did I get laid off? Why can't I find a job? And we say these things, why, why, why? And our attitude is always, why? Why can't I have tran total tranquility? Why can't this be paradise? The whole point of transitions, the whole point of why things are moving around you is to change who, where? Inside of you. But because our attitude is so aloof, because we're so used to missing things, we let our life pass by us. Who we be, who, the things we could do, things we could become. Why do we have this vision in 180 to release people who embrace change? Well, that's not going to only just make you good in business because we want you to do well in business. But it also applies to our everyday life. If we become people who embrace change and then resist it, well, first we learn why. Because, because why? Because simply and tragically what? Come on, read it with me. Most, are you missing it? Are you missing the opportunities that God's giving you right now? You're just complaining and whining. We talked about it. Uh, you're just whining about your life in the transitions, in the crisis, in the season. Or are you seeing the window of life change? And you can't complain because Rahab had a worse than you. All right? She had a worse than you because no one here is a prostitute. Well, if you are. Well, okay, let's not go there. 
You don't have it worse than her. But she saw the opportunity. She heard the good news. But you know, the most tragic thing about this passage is not that people always miss things, miss the most important things in their life over and over again perpetually, and they forfeit the opportunity to become more and really live the dream that's calling them to a bigger story than the pseudo-narrative that we live in, this small world we live in. It's the reason behind why we miss it. And I pray that the Holy Spirit today would convict a lot of you, and even people watching on YouTube, because I know for a fact that God is speaking to everyone in this planet. God loves people. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why he came, Jesus said, for the sick. He came for the sheep that are lost. And in very simply, empirically, this is universal, the gospel, that people, God is speaking and in conversation with a lot of us. Not some of us, everyone. To God, there is no labels. It's lost sons or found sons. Lost daughters or found daughters. The reason why we miss it is more tragic than the, than the actual result that we miss it. So let's look here, and I want you to catch this. Look, look at this, verse 11. I want everyone to read it with me. Okay, from, from when. See, you see that? When. It's when it's time to change. Okay, verse 11, when we, well, you don't know how to read anymore? Okay, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. Now read this out loud. For the Lord your God is the God in heaven above and on earth below. A prostitute. A hoe declared a revelation that even the Israelites were trying to really learn by a third point of view. She said, your God is the God of the universe. He is the God of all. Because only that God could do what he did in Egypt. And what he did in Egypt compared... To us, we're nothing compared to them. We're just going to be what? Overtaken easily. It's not going to even be a fight. Even without special revelation, even without God, the people of God giving her a Bible, a Pentateuch, a Torah, she already knew in her heart, in her conscience, viscerally, she knew by intuition that this was God. And this was an opportunity for her to meet this God. And to be part of a community that knew this God. And let me just tell you, it doesn't matter how far you are from God, how morally bankrupt you are, it doesn't matter what your label is religiously, it doesn't matter where you are politically, well, maybe it matters. Let me just tell you right now, she heard God's voice. Even through history. And you know what she did? She didn't ignore it. She didn't ignore it. She embraced it. How many people here have an iPhone? Say amen if you have an iPhone. Be proud. <laughs> Apple proud. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, they did a study that everyone that owns an iPhone is more, a little more arrogant than people that own an Android phone. This is absolutely untrue because Tay has an Android phone and and I know him personally, and I don't know how that could be the case. Maybe that's an exception. But I'm serious. If you own an iPhone, or if you own any smartphone, there's a functionality when someone calls you where it says accept or what? Ignore. For me, I don't even take phone calls anymore. It just goes to my Google voicemail. I do not want to pick up the phone anymore. I do not want to deal with that because so many phone calls come, right? How many people here, be honest with me now, now don't tell people who you ignore, but I know you people, you, you know, you ignore. When those phone calls come, you may, you may, you may, you know, make it look like that, oh, oh you called me? Really? I had no idea. I have five missed calls. When you ignored, 
Well, if you intentionally press that button, that's rejection. Okay? And how many people in here do that? You know? Ignore, ignore. Because you don't want to deal with these people. You don't want to pick up that phone call. And you ignore it. And you know who's calling, and that's the whole beauty of the smartphone, is that you don't need to reject anyone, and they don't need to know. You could do it in secret. No one's feelings are hurt. You could just lie about it. But you know who's calling. You're just choosing to ignore. The greatest tragedy in the gospel story, with especially people who go to church, and I'll talk about people who don't go to church and are actually seeking or not even seeking, the greatest tragedy of why we miss change, the most powerful transformation in our lives, is not because we're ignorant to God's power or we're ignorant to God's voice. The greatest tragedy is we know God's voice, but we choose to ignore it. We're like, damn it, what I come to this service. Because Rahab didn't know God's voice. She didn't have special revelation. She didn't have church. She didn't have the, the old covenant. She didn't have the Torah. She heard it from the third source, and she carpe diem that moment to change. For a lot of us in this room, we're not, gonna, we're, we're not just missing our destiny, missing opportunities for growth and transformation as the gospel promises, not because we're ignorant to that opportunity. We just ignore God's voice blatantly. Isn't that true? That's a tragedy. And let me tell you, I've been in ministry for a long time. I see people miss so many different opportunities. They continue to resist the voice of God in their life. And let me, let me just tell you, even you people that don't believe in Christ, that have not surrendered your leadership to Christ yet, you're listening to this message, and you know who you are, and you know God is speaking to you. You just don't want to surrender. You just don't want him to be boss. Because you're comfortable with being your own boss. And you're like, no, I don't like change. And you know, you hear it inside of you. But you're like, no, 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 I can't do it, I can't do it. And you're not even ignorant to it. God is knocking in the door of your life, but you continue to simply ignore it and drown the voice out. And other, you might even use stupid excuses like, oh, I don't even know if this is real or not. Yeah, you do. You felt the goosebumps. And it's right there. And today... It's not simply a message of grace saying, oh, God loves you. God, that's evident. Jesus died from the cross for us. He sent his only one son to love us and find us when we're lost. Today, my question to you is, let's not act stupid. Let's, not, let's be honest with ourselves and say, if we wanted to really change today, we could. So let me ask you a question. What is God saying to you? Where are the areas in your life God is speaking to you about that you continue to resist? Today, let it be a day where you pick up the call, where you embrace what he is saying. So, why do we want to release people that embrace change in 180. Well, second is what? Read it with me. Because tragically in, tell someone, you're an idiot. No, no, tell someone confident, you're an idiot. Why are we idiots? Listen, I told you last week that the problem of reaching destiny, the problem of reaching the highest of heights of God's dream for us is not because we're, we're what? We lack ability, a lack even intelligence. We do it because we lack character. So if you know something that's good for you, you know something that God is doing something, and you purposely ignore it, what is that called? Stupid. Stupid. Idiotic. The tragedy is we missed the opportunity to change, not because of anything else but idiocy. We're just, we just want to be right. We just want to be, how many people like being right? I do. How many people like being wrong? 
And that's a lot of agnostic and atheists and even a lot of us that's stuck in certain character areas in our life. We just, we're just stubborn. I don't want to be wrong. You're just like a little baby. You know what G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton says? He's an old English prolific writer that led C.S. Lewis to Christ by his books. He said to the atheist, he says, the worst day for the atheist is to be really thankful but have no one to thank. You're like, oh, what does that mean? Just think about it for a little more. <laughs> well, what, what does Chesterton mean? It means that you have joy in your heart, and you have this, this, un, this unexpected joy bubbling up inside of you that there is something more to life, but then you just have to admit, because of your paradigm, you have to say, because of your worldview, that's just an accident, and that sucks, because that could never happen again. It's an accident. Listen, the truth is, we can come up with these ideologies and intellectual snobbery about why we don't want to believe in God, but the truth is, God is already speaking and people know it. It's time to be wrong. It's time to be humble and embrace change. Today is the day. It's time. Tell someone it's time. I want you to shake your head. It's time. It's time to change. So today, will you stand with me? Lift your hands. And I want you to repeat after me as you lift your hands to God. God, come on, say it with me. God, today, I refuse to be stupid. I refuse to be stubborn, and I choose to change. Give me this opportunity to change. Now go to God and say, God, I know what you want me to change. Help me change. Let the power of the gospel come in those areas of my life. I don't want to miss this opportunity for your dream for my life. Some of you right now are complaining about your life. That it doesn't make any sense. Well, duh, it doesn't make any sense because God is working on your character. He doesn't give you everything easily, I said last week. God, those dots that don't make sense will make sense because you're not writing the story. God's writing the story. So stop freaking complaining and get back in line and let God mold you and change you and let him use you just like Joshua. So Holy Spirit, I want to welcome you right now. All the complainers, all the whiners in this room. I pray we'd be humble today. I pray today we would admit that we're wrong. And heed to the voice of God.
your glory and your fame. It's not about me. As if you should do things my way, you alone are God, and I surrender to your ways. Father, I want to pray this afternoon. Father, I want to pray for alertness to come over our spirit. That we wouldn't allow this opportunity, this revelation to slip from our fingers again. Just because we're so stupid sometimes with our life. We want our lives to advance, but we fail to advance what's inside of us. That's going to sustain that advancement. Father, we continue to chase after things that we will lose if the man inside does not transform. Ability gets us there, but character keeps us there. Father, we pray right now that we will allow you, we will allow the gospel to take its effect and make us a new creation in Christ. Change us, God. Help us to be tenacious about this change in our life, not to take it lightly, but take it seriously. Jesus, we give you permission today to send people to our lives. To continue to press us. You know, my wife, as she led worship this morning, she prayed David's prayer. And I want everyone that is serious about this to pray this prayer. And I have prayed it, but if you want to pray, just remember when you pray, God really answers. My wife prayed Psalm 139 today. If there's any wicked way in me, if there's any offensive way in me, God, lead me to the way of life. Lead me out of it, God. David prays. He's praying for things he can't even see yet. Now, if you want to be a person that lives God's dream for you, pray that prayer right now in your heart. Say, God, any offensive way in me, any wicked way in me, even the things I can't even recognize in myself, Will you pull out of me? Use whatever means necessary. Because I want to live the dream you have for my life. I want to become everything you see in me. In Jesus' name, all God's people pray. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering to the Lord. Can be seated? I've been talking a lot about this this year being a year of promise. A year of promise and victory for people. have been waiting on God's promises. There have been delays in your life. Well, this week, one of my delays were gone. God's ta- God has told me um, many promises, especially in the media, that God would begin to open doors for us, and especially for me, to influence celebrities and musicians. Now, when I was 25, I was like, God, how are you going to do that? All I have, all musician I have is this guy, I'm in. <laughs> we tried to sell his CD and, and we sold 100. I lost money on my investment. <laughs> As you know, last year we went to Korea, worked with many international artists over there, and hooked up with uh, Bobby Shin, the producer of Jason Mraz and uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, he basically produces most uh, famous Christian artists as well, like Stephen Curtis Chapman. This week, out of nowhere, I come back right before the, you know, middle of the week. Bobby calls me and says, Sam, do you have time to Skype for a bit? And I said, all right. When, you know, a famous producer calls you, you go, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so I go, yeah, I have some time. In the next five minutes, we go on Skype, and he's just like, oh, he's like, in, in, um, actually, Bobby is a Nashville fob. He's Southern, Korean, and American at the same time, so it's ha- kind of hard to understand what he's saying. <laughs> he has a Southern fob accent. So, <laughs> you know, how are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. 
All my accents sound alike, so. Um, <laughs> somebody asked me one time, why is your Indian accent and Chinese accent? And every S sounds, I'm, I have no idea. It's just one accent. But he, you know, he was telling me, he goes, and he started talking, he goes, you know, Sam, I, I've been, you know, praying about my next steps. You know, I'm a real successful, and I'm rich. I'm like, yeah, you are. And he goes, God has put my heart to begin to, to really work and, and, and take some risks on certain things. And um, I was wondering if I could just, you know, bounce some ideas off of you. I said, okay, sure. And my wife was like, man, he talks, you know. I hope he doesn't watch this. And, you know, and, um, you know, and um, you know, we're talking. He's like, well, I have a project in Brazil. You think you can do this project in Brazil? And, and you know, in the end of March, I'm like, maybe. And I told the guys while I was talking on the phone, they're like, some of the guys in media were like, Brazil, yeah, Rio, you know, and, and um, you know, we're, we're talking. And then after, after we talked about 40 minutes, he goes, Sam, here's eight projects. I'm like, how many eight projects? I want you to do them with me. And, we're, and I'm thinking all the dollar bills, we're like, this is good. This is, this is good for Jesus, you know? And then we, we, we continue to talk, and then he goes, you know, Sam, I want, I want us to hang out. I want you to come down to Nashville. Let's hang out for a couple of, let's, I love talking to you, yeah. That's, he said that. You know, I feel this passion dreaming, you know? He goes, and if you want me to do anything for you, because you're so open with me, you know, we could be friends and hang out. If you want me to produce anything for you, I'll do it. Last week I said at stat service, I said that one day there will be hill songs at 180 Church. I found my producer. <laughs> People, the Bible tells us that if you obey him and fully walk in his commands, he shall lift you up high above what? The nations. Let me tell you, the delays are breaking off. Continue to follow after God in the trials, in the darkness. Do not doubt what God has said in the light, in the darkness. Amen? Because it will come. It's coming for me. It will come for you. Right? You're part of 180. You're under the covering of that blessing. Now, it's really, it's, if you're a musician, it's time to be excited now. This is the best time in 180 ever. So I want to ask you to press through your own darkness, your own promises that God's given you, and follow hard after God even though the dots might not make sense because he's connecting them. And I want to pray for some of you that's going through that today for those delays to be gone, okay? Secondly, we had two people join God's family this week. Let's give God a hand for that. Now, the first person that came was, was this past Sunday in our stat service she is Jewish. A Jewish mom comes to Christ. Her greatest obstacle of coming to Christ was that she was Jewish until she found out that Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> and she gave her life to Jesus, and her husband came this week, and, and he's a Christian. He was like, I've been praying for her for years, and now she's finally come to know Jesus. And the other, uh, you know, other daughter of one of our families came to Christ right on Sunday. Two people. God is moving people, amen? Continue to believe in the people you're talking to about Christ. Right now, ride the momentum. When, you, when, the, when the wave comes, just ride it. It's about, you need to surf this year. There's a lot of waves you need to catch. God's moving in, in very powerful ways. So continue to pray for small groups and let God continue to work in those areas because God is doing some amazing things. Okay? Okay? Lastly, we thank you for giving to 180 and making all these things possible. And a lot of you are so faithful to God doing this. And I'm proud, a lot of you, for tithing faithfully, right? I'm proud of you. You know, I don't even need to bring it up and tell people in smart, go beat them up. God, some of you are take, being responsible and owning the local church as the hope of the world and letting this gospel go out everywhere. And I want to thank you for that. So if you want to give, you can give at your news, 180church.tv, or you can give in the info booth, okay? Let's just pray for those things, and let's call it a day. Father, we want to pray right now for the delays in people's lives. I want to pray, God, that as you promise us in the gospel, that when we align ourselves to you in our ability and submit our ability and our character, 
you will begin to rise us up high above the nations to represent you and to bring you glory and to give us joy. I want to pray for the people that are, that are experiencing delays in their lives, that they would be encouraged by these stories and follow hard after God. And they would allow these dots to connect and allow them to transform them and change them so God can use them. And Father, I want to pray for these small groups where people are in conversation about Jesus. We want to pray that more people would find you this year than ever we've experienced in the last couple of years in 180's history. I want to pray, God, that you be on that. Spirit of God, be on that today. And lastly, Lord, we want to thank you for all the people that give toward this mission of spreading the gospel in, in the city and to the world. We want to pray, God, that you bless them even more and provide for them. And Father, so that the gospel can go from this city to the whole world. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you soon.